little introduction for anyone who doesn't know me. I'm Emma. I'm uh, one of the whiskey specialists at the Whiskey List. Um, and today we're going to be doing the uh, old Caden, very old Cadenheads tasting, which is so exciting. It's the uh, second last in our uh, top shelf tasting series. The last one is coming soon, and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about tickets for that um, later on tonight. You guys get first dibs and first access, which is exciting. Um, and joining me tonight is Graham from the Odd Whiskey Koi, which is so exciting. Um, oh. Yeah. So without further ado, um, Graham, did you want to take us through the first whiskey? And I'll pop the list of the whiskeys in order in the chat. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. It's, uh, it's hi, everyone. Uh, welcome from a, um, well, it is a sunny, sunny Adelaide afternoon. So uh, it's a bit cool at the moment. And I just want to say, Emma, you, you're uh, hiding under a bushel there. She's, uh, she's a very class act. And so you've got this scruffy bugger in uh, South Australia going to take over today. So, uh, but we're, we're, we're going on a, a really interesting journey. And I've got to congratulate you for joining this tasting because you're probably this is a very elite group that basically wants to know about grain whiskies because they basically the most hardest things to sell in Australia. People just don't understand them, uh, generally don't like them because we've always been brought up that malt is best. So tonight, if you've got that sort of attitude, what I want you to do is to take off your malt hat, get rid of it because we're talking about completely different grains completely different flavors and but we're going on a really quite an incredible journey so what are we talking about then so we instead of using malted barley in a pot still we're going back to we're going to one of the really big in, industrial style distillation processes which we, is the column still or the continuous still or the coffee still so basically it's a uh, uh, um, um, a method where we can produce ethanol at really high ABVs and lots of it continuously. And uh, we'll get to the reason why, but um, it's basically an awfully dry argument, isn't it? So what we're going to do is we're going to be nice and friendly and start you off with something really quite unique and special. So while I'm chatting away, you've actually got something to try. And one we're going to start off with is from um, William Cadenheads, Cadenhead. I've been, I always get um, corrected by the chaps from, uh, from Campbelltown. So it's not, not the Australian Caden, it's Cadden. And um, uh, we're going to try their creations 26 years of age. And now this is going to be the youngest spirit we'll be trying tonight. There's a, there's a key. There's an absolute key. So, um, Pour yourself a nice big glass, which will be 15 or 30 mils. What do they get, Emma? Um, I believe they are 30, 20 mil pours. 20 mil pours. Oh, there we go. So I've got mine. And I want to say welcome. If I had any Scots in me, I would say Schlangevar, but I don't. So my heritage stops at Adrian's Wall. So we'll, we'll leave that there anyway for the prior present. And, uh, and so welcome to, to this rather unique and special tasting. And I'm going to stick my nose in that and say, um, what a way to start. Nice big creamy oak, lots of things going on in there. And uh, this is a creation, if anybody knows, the ex-head distiller out of Springbank by the name of Frank McCarty. Springbank were finding that they had a whole heap of casts that were basically uh, disappearing to nothing and they had to do something about it. And a lot of it was really, really old stuff. So he just came up with the idea of banging it all together in a, in a blend and uh, creating this range called Creations uh, at cast strength and it's at some extreme ages. And uh, we've had a lot of fun with those over the last few years, but... Uh, I'm sad to say, and we'll probably discuss this a bit later on, that uh, they've now finished. What I like about this, though, this, this is a gentle introduction to the world of brain whiskies because we've got a big dose of malt in here. And I'll just let you into a little secret what's actually in it. There's a bit of Glen Livet, there's a bit of Brook Laddick, there's a bit of Glen Grant, a bit of Altmore, Tamdu, Strathisla, 
and Bravel as well. So something really fascinating and interesting and uh, hopefully highly intriguing. So uh, give that a belt, see what you think. Now, I think as well, you know, when we obviously talk about like grain whiskey, you know, we, we think of all whiskey is grain whiskey, right? And, and it is 100%. And, you know, when you do start to really hone in on grain, single grain whiskeys and stuff like that, it is that not malted barley. Pretty much any grain that's not malted barley is, is what we're really thinking of, isn't it? And, 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 and tonight, too, you'll actually notice that, interestingly enough, Cadenets have listed all their products as single grain. Mm. So I'm taking a punt that's mainly wheat. So that's what we're going to be probably looking at. Possibly, yeah. possibly, I think it should be a bit of corn. But uh, anyway, uh, a really good comment. It, this is mouth coating, rich, flavoursome, really good use of oak. Fantastic. Nice long palate. Um, this, you know, there's um, nice raisin fruit in there as well. Uh, the malt quality is good. And that's, that's shining through. We're not actually seeing much of the grain. Um, and uh, what is a grain whiskey? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. And uh, yeah, kind of, uh, one of the mouthfeel for me is everything. And sort of like custard creams on the palate as well. So just, just a joy. And at 57.7, fabulous balance. They just get that so right. So you've got loads of oak holding up uh, lots of good grain character. And, and, and then that, that spirit just underneath keeping it alive. And at 26 years of age, pretty smart, I would have thought. And the really good news or the really bad news from my perspective is it's sold out. So you probably drank the last bottle, basically. <laughs> so let's move on. So there we go. I hope everybody enjoyed that. That's a nice way to start. Now, normally, the, the current way of thinking is that uh, you get the presenter, he... Um, he rabbits on for about, or he or she rabbits on, or she or he rabbits on for about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, bores everybody silly. But what we've found in research is that it builds expectation so that when you actually do finally get to taste the whiskey, uh, it tastes so good because we finally made it. So we're cheating tonight. We're actually going out early to get your palate trained up there. So what are we talking So, so what are we talking about? We're talking about you know, in big industrial um, uh, plants. And they basically use grain whiskey for the blend trade. And this comes out, it's a basically an, uh, an, an historic thing that, that occurred basically in the 1830s when coffee d d developed this skill, that you could produce really, really cheap spirit without having to use expensive single malt. And that's basically what it is. And that's the whole world of blends. So the majority of, you know, you your Johnny Walkers or your, your famous grouses or whatever, the majority of the spirit in there is some sort of grain. And by grain, it could be wheat, it could be, um, bar, uh, it could be you know, a bit of barley in there if it's cheap enough. Uh, it'll be corn, um, um, all sorts of, you know, anything, any basic carbohydrate source they can, you know, grain carbohydrate source they can get and they can do it cheaply. And that's the whole idea. And we're talking about distilleries that start producing at around about 140 odd million litres annually. So these guys pump it continuously. So basically you feed the bottom of the still, it goes through, comes out the end and you just keep feeding it, just keeps coming out. So it's not batch distillation. Yeah. For us so, to not, yep, go on. Oh, sorry. So I think um, Basil was asking about the Nika coffee grain and that's actually a, a really good kind of segue into you know, pumping out the spirit, like you were saying, coffee stills are a uh, Irish invention by a man named Aeneas Coffee, and they are essentially continuously running, make a lot of grain whiskey. Uh, and Nika coffee grain is a grain. It's not a single grain, though. It's got a little bit of malted barley in it. So. Malted barley. Yeah. Generally, you will find uh, it's a bit like the Americans with, uh, with their whiskies that uh, basically fermenting grain is really difficult. And there's two ways you can do it. You can start the ferment off by actually putting a bit of malted barley to get it going, or you use enzymes. And mm -hmm. um, that, that in, in the case there, so they, they mix it a little bit in there. Um, what 
we find fascinating, and this is why I asked you to take your malt hat off, is that we get a completely different flavour profile of the malted barley. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's a little bit weird. It's a bit wonderful. It's very perfumed. They get exotic flavours um, and, they're, and they're just a little bit out of the ordinary. And that's why I think a lot of the public just, just can't, can't get their heads around. And, um, and the reason that we, we're trying them at such advanced age is basically that's the only, the only type of styles of uh, grain whiskies we can get. Uh, if you have a think about it, if we're producing a, you know, a famous blended whisky and we put a nice age statement of 25 or 30 years, we've got to actually have a grain whiskey that's at that age that can match the malt. So what we find then is that uh, these, all these whiskies tonight will be all, uh, except for one, are all bourbon cast matured. And I would probably um, hang my hat on and say those casks weren't really don't give much out. They're a, they're a method of um, storage that you can actually have, have advanced age. So we've had we've had some Cadenhead whiskies that have um, are up to forty years of age. And the other thing for the consumer too, for you guys out there, they're cheap. So you can drink, you can, you can you could drink a twenty or thirty or forty year old whiskey virtually every night, but it it won't be a malt. So as I said, this, this grew out of the, the 1830s and we've got uh, Mr. Coffee. So that nick of coffee has not, nothing to do with the, uh, the coffee you drink. It's, it's to do with this, this chat. And it's also about, this is a big story about the lowlands versus the highlands through the 1850s, through the 1860s and the growth of, of the famous um, whiskey merchants, you know, your Johnny Walkers, your Justerinian Brooks, your um, Berry Brothers and Rudd and them creating blends um, and uh, famously um, we'll take the Walker exercise or the famous grouse or Buchanan's uh, uh, black and white and they would wanted to produce they were basically lowland producers looking to produce a very very cheap spirit that had to have had a bit of flavor so pot still production of single malts is really expensive but with this new invention from Mr Aeneas Coffee we could produce a spirit that's really cheap. And if we blend the two, basically the, uh, the coffee still product is fairly neutral. And then our flavor comes from the more expensive um, uh, uh, single malt, the pot stills. And, and we've seen over time that with clever marketing and, and the power of these lowland distillers uh, basically pushed malts into the background. Now, this brings in a chap by the name of William Caddenhead, you know, we're, we're um, going to be talking about quite a bit because um, his company, which has been around since 1842, so they're the oldest Scottish independent bottlers, um, started out life as a, uh, a, a basically a wine and spirit merchant and uh, uh, by a chap by, it was actually founded by a chap by George Duncan in 1842 and then um, dear George didn't do a terribly good job in Aberdeen is where the business was based um, so he needed a bit of publicity so he thought I'll bring on William Cadenhead he's quite famous around uh, Aberdeen and people will you know obviously come to um, join um, meet him at the shop and you know we can sell our goods that way and you know what he was famous for he was the town's poet and in that stage, he was an absolute superstar. Everybody wanted to. He published books. He was out and about. He was in the, you know, living the high life. That was that was a big form of entertainment. And um, uh, dear old uh, George died in 1859 and uh, and left the business to, to William. And uh, famously, William ended up marrying the widow, so he kept it in the family. And uh, he grew the business and. Um, one of the things that he, uh, he came across was uh, he had a, a number of malt whiskey suppliers. And, and so he actually learned a good idea is actually blending them together. So he was one of the very, very first to actually conceive the idea of a vatted malt. And also with the grain coming along, he would add that and then create their own blends. So the malt distilleries wouldn't sell. They, they don't only sell to merchants. They wouldn't bottle as packaging like we know that today. And believe it or not, malt whiskey really didn't start becoming popular as a as a an as a official bottlings till the 1960s. So these spirit merchants are very very important, 
and particularly for us, uh, William Cadenhead. Um, Daryl William, he died in uh, 1904. That was left to his, uh, to his son-in-law, Robert Duthie. Um, Duthie built the business, um, but ran into a number of troubles, particularly in the 1920s. And um, sadly, got hit by a tram and died. And uh, um, the business was left to the company secretary, a, a Ms. Anne Oliver. Now, Anne was uh, really quite, uh, quite a good op operator in some regards. She knew how to buy, but she had a bit of a problem. She didn't know how to sell. So the business basically went bankrupt by about 1960. And there was banks foreclosed on it, shut the place down. They brought Christie's in in the 1970s and they said, right, we're going to have a sale to pay our debts. And um, at the time in 1972, um, that was going to be one of the biggest auctions Britain's ever had. It was massive. And because uh, what they didn't realise is that she kept buying and buying and buying and storing but not selling so when they came to actually list uh the catalog i think the catalog was something like 132 pages of casks and uh let me just tell you just a couple that were up for sale at that time there was a 67 mccallum in cask a 67 glenmore or glenvore 65 rosebank and a 63 talisker amongst them and when the sale was completed, it was a six-figure sale for the time, so it went into millions of pounds, not only paid the, the, the debts off, but there was a surplus. Quite extraordinary. And we introduced another character at this stage by the name of uh, Headley, Mr. Headley Wright. And him and his family owned a small company down in Campbelltown called Springbank Stillers. And in the 1960s, there was a glass shortage. So Mr. Wright actually got involved in this sale of this Aberdeen spirit merchant because there was a rumour that he, they had glass bottles. And out of that auction, he actually ended up with some casks and the company, but no glass bottles. There was no bottles to be had. So he thought, oh, well, what we'll do is that uh, we'll keep the company going, we'll move it to Campbelltown, and hence Campbelltown came into the Springbank fold uh, as we know it today. So that's, that's the story of um, uh, the whiskey. So uh, grain whiskies have been very, as I said, very, very important to the trade. They're absolutely massive, you know, big plants, big brands, everything's big about it. But we get these gems, these ones that are put aside for a very specific purpose of, of creating complexity and intrigue you know, in some of these absolute premium blends. So we could imagine, you know, we'd say, you know, some of the, the Johnny Walker Blue Label expressions or uh, uh, some of the Shivers um, older expressions too. A lot of that material that gives it that real go would be coming from the grain. So this brings up to our, our number two whiskey then. So we're going to a, a distillery uh, based in uh, Glasgow. Uh, it's called Strathclyde and it's a 26 year old. So if you want to pour yourself a glass of that. How do we go with the creations anyway? Does any, any, anybody not like it? Anybody like it? I think there was a bit of a consensus that it was quite tasty. Some tasty. minty notes. <laughs> James has already cracked on to <laughs> number three or so. But yeah. Um, Woody, talking. raisin, light spice. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Really, really nice. Yeah. So, so here we go. So we've actually got a um, a same vintage. We've, we're at fifty eight percent. So, uh, uh, so we've got a, a similar sort of structure, but we've basically taken with this one all the malt out of it. So this will give you a really good idea about what a grain whiskey is all about. So let's give that a belt. Yeah. So Strathclyde is. Yeah, fantastic. Go on, Graham. No, that's all right. I was just about to say, uh, so we're based in Glasgow. Uh, for those aficionados out there, this was the home of King Clay, if you can ever get hold of it, probably one of the most collectible malts on earth. 
It's currently owned by Pernod Ricard. So, and for the technical minded out there, it's a two column sister with an analyzer and a rectifier. Now, does any, anybody know what they are? Because I think I've only just learned what they are. Yeah. I'm still working on learning what they are. <laughs> Well, yeah. an analyze is interesting because that's made out of stainless steel. So the spirit first goes through that basically to clear out the sulfur, yeah. gets rid of the sulfur out of the out of the ferment, and then the rectifier is another as uh, the other column, which is basically copper plates, and then that's where we start producing our final spirit. And as I said, yeah. a lot of these spirits come out really high strength, like 95, 96 percent ABV. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of these grain distilleries are built as we need to make a lot of really clean, neutral-ish spirit, you right. know, because we need to put it down for blending. I believe Strathclyde was originally opened to make base spirit for gin, uh, which is actually another origin a lot of grain distilleries find themselves in. They're, you know, one of the ones we're tasting later tonight is actually the base spirit for Tanqueray and Smirnoff, which is ah, that's right, yes. Russian. <laughs> And then, of course, we, we actually have a, a big producer here, which uh, uh, is based in the Barossa and is the basically generating most of the spirit for the current gin craze in Australia, and that's Tarak. And they produce, they're, they're an amazing company because they basically scab any form of um, grape or grain-based carbohydrate and then turn it into alcohol in, in, a, in an amazing way. And that's what they're basically these guys. So you get that really grassy, you get that uh, on the nose, you, you find the, the oak is subdued. So again, that's what I'm saying, they're probably just using really neutral casks because they just want age in the spirit, not oak, not oak influence. Mm -hmm. Let's have a try. Yeah, and this is the grain you can find in Valentine's and Teacher's Blends. Um, it was Correct. very, very common. Mm -hmm. So you will, um, you will obviously, um, when you try those whiskies, what you'll be trying, you'll be very, very difficult to actually pick out the grain component because it'll be dominated by the malt. Yeah. Yeah. And Strathclyde uses mostly wheat base for their grains. So like we were talking about before, you know, it's anything other than malted barley. Um, they do use a little bit of malted barley again to get that ferment going and kickstart it. But in this one, it's, it's just wheat spirit. As you can see, compared to the creations, this is a lot harder. The, 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 the grain spirits come across as a little bit harder as well, even, even on the nose. Mm. Yeah, we've got some great tasting notes, mild mint, woody mint, ginger, cinnamon. Ginger's been a, been a pretty popular tasting note on this one. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got uh, my notes have got ginger and cinnamon. Um, so in that, um, yeah, gingerbread. <laughs> A little bit of honeycomb in there as well, which is actually quite pleasing. Yeah. But yeah. you can see by the, they're really interesting flavours, not what we're normally used to. Mm, yeah. I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong. Atley saying, is, is it just that good or is this difference between the mouthfeel between high ABV grain and high ABV malts? And, yeah, I think it's that base makes such a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, and it's good though. Complex. That's, that's the word we're looking for, it's complexity. Yeah, and that's what most blenders are looking for. They're looking for something that is, you know, adds that complexity, that, that little bit of chewiness, that mouthfeel, but isn't going to overpower a malt. So yeah. that's why it's so popular for blending. Yeah, exactly right. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll move on. Go on to number three. Yeah, uh, are we going to have a second glass of that one or are we going to move on? <laughs> If anyone's got any left. <laughs> okay, yeah, whiskey number three. That's right. We're into the uh, closed distillery called Caledonia. Uh, basically based in Edinburgh. Uh, it was closed in 88. So there, there's an interesting thing. So we're on a 28-year-old. Um, and supposedly this was one of the largest grain distilleries in the UK. Massive. Um, and was owned by... Um, uh, then United Distillers, and we know that today is Diageo, so that would be supplying, you know, effectively Johnny Walker and, uh, you know, a few other other big, big, big brands. Um, this one we have got stock of, and I meant to say too, we have got stock of the, uh, no, the Strathclyde's out. 
no stock on that, no stock on creations, but this one we, we do actually have. Yeah, so this one's actually really exciting as well because like Graham was saying, it's a closed distillery. This is a 1987, you know, laid down. The distillery co closed in 1988. So this is probably one of the last hundred or so barrels that was ever laid down. Um, yeah, the, the and as, as with all independent bottlings, this will be effectively off a single cask. I should have probably pointed that out. So that, that's basically what uh, Caden had um, uh, do mainly uh, in the old days, but we're, they're they're changing that that program at the moment. Um, so yeah. Mm. Anyway, so let's have a sniff. Let's have a smell. Let's have a let's have a taste. Yeah, Basil's already on it with the the dates, the raisins, mandarin. Mandarin's a good call. Yeah. Yeah, I love getting those like fruit peel notes. Yeah, I get a bit of chocolate notes on there as well. You have to say out of the, you know, the three, the noses are really clean. And again, this gets back down to the spirit. So they're, they're, they're wanting no grunge, no, you know, wide cuts or, you know, whatever it is. Everything's going to be absolutely, you know, crystal clear and, 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 and clean as a whistle. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You get that person talking about two out of grain whiskey. So that's, that's starting to come through on this uh, Caledonia. Yeah, I think um, Caledonian, Caledonian's one that, you know, comes across very, very infrequently. You know, you don't really see it much anymore. And it was one of the, obviously, the big Diageo powerhouses of grain um, during yeah. this time. But, yeah. but it's extraordinary, isn't it? 28 years of age, 52.3%, and that spirit is so fresh and lively. Yeah. Just drives that palate. Quite a drying palette. I like the uh, the the note there from uh, from one of our from one of our tasters about the the chocolate chocolate note too. Yeah. Mm, cool. Yeah, and Andreas with the vanilla, the raw sugar, because that grain gives that sweetness without being saturated. Yeah. 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 Creamy caramel. Uh, uh, one of my notes here is an old fashioned sweet shop. Yeah. <laughs> mm, good old Wally stores. <laughs> interesting so a slightly different mouthfeel too the, the, the on the palate from the the strathclyde as well so we, we get subtle differences you know they're not big swings like we would get in the malt world they're, they're very very subtle yeah yeah and that's the thing as well because like you were saying earlier it's it's predominantly ex-bourbon cast because you don't want to over activate those flavors you you they've designed to be old and you know approachable so yeah exactly right i mean one of the one of the big things uh uh you know using other forms of oak is that they just take up too much too quickly mm. so i always i always felt that you know older older single malts it, it it they're an almost an oddity they shouldn't exist you know that um that they've reached 25 or 30 years of age and they haven't just basically become oak bombs and, and nothing else, you know, that they actually survive. So that, that, that's really quite rare. So to actually see, you know, um, um, spirits of this age, it's quite extraordinary. Yeah, it's it's absolutely that thing of, you know, you hear about oh, this you know, 40 year old whiskey and spent its entire life in a first little sherry cask. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you, you doing? <laughs> You can still taste whiskey through it. I'm shocked. Um, yeah, and you know anything, anything that does have that like really old age statement, I want it to be in a bourbon cask because I know that it's just had that time to, you know, mature and relax and not be aggravated by all the sugars and stuff. So very quality. I really like the notes that are coming up because this is really mm. suggesting, particularly this Caledonia, this thing's complex. There's a lot going on in it. And that's what we normally write that off and say, oh, no, these are boring, they're bland, they're dull. You know, this is, no, this, but they're something you've got to work at. You know, you, you've got to think about it. They're not yeah. obvious. Yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, like Basil was saying, they're just so drinkable as well. You know, they are complex, but not challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. We, sh we should set up a grain tasting club. That's what we should do. <laughs> Green appreciation. Yeah, yeah, no, it'd be a very exclusive organisation, I can tell you. Yeah. 
All right, should we pop on over to the, the fourth whiskey on the list? Why not? Why not? I'm going yeah. to have a treat with that one. <laughs> a fresh glass. Yeah. Okay, so now we, um, and as you see, all these distilleries are basically uh, tonight will be, uh, are all based in the, in the big conurbation that is Glasgow and, and Edinburgh. So, you know, the big townships, it's the industrial heart of it. And again, it goes back to these roots of in the lowlands. So we don't see any of these big plants up in up in the north or in the highlands. This is all about the lowlands, and obviously that's where the, the centre of you know um, uh, Scottish grain production is. That's for sure. So we're moving to Canvas, another closed distillery. Eh? We're doing all right, aren't we? So there you go. You can buy a closed distillery that's not got uh, a one with about four zeros after it. So that's pretty good. So we're going to uh, Ottawa. So we're halfway sort of between uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, a big plant that was originally owned by uh, United Distillers. And it was closed in 1993. So once again, we've got a uh, 29 years of age. And even after 29 years of age, it's 45.4%. So I imagine our, our good friends at uh, Cadmeds were probably starting to panic to think, hang on, the um, ABV is going down and down and down. We better, we better bottle this up fairly quickly. Um, uh, yeah, just again, fascinating stuff. So let's have a let's have a look. Yep. this is one of the the rare uh, grain whiskies that actually had its own official bottlings. You know, I like guess. we think of official bottling single malts all the time, but yeah, it's not often we see official. Grain whiskies. I think I think there's only two currently in the marketplace, isn't there? There's Cameron Brig. Hmm. Yeah. And but even then, it, we barely see it here in Australia. Yeah. It was pretty um, pretty horrible last time I brought it in. That's for sure. <laughs> it's the problem with original bottling. Sometimes you know what they want to portray is not always the best aspect yeah. of the distillery because they want to hoard that for other special adventures. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So the the site that Canvas uh, was on still in use by Diageo by uh, you know just now Diageo um, and they revamped it as a cooperage. So they still use it, just not for whiskey yeah. anymore. Yeah, that's right. It's cooperage, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You can imagine if you're uh, pumping out you know hundreds of millions of liters, how many barrels you would need in any one production run. It's quite extraordinary. Absolutely yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, and then to age them. Mm. Now we've got a, this is to me is completely different kettle of fish to the other two that we just tried. Yeah, the tasting notes everyone's got rhubarb, uh, Brazil nuts, almonds, finding so it hard to pull nuts out. Definitely, yeah. you know, even though it is such a low ABV, maybe a drop of water will, you know, cut through that kind of like marzipan aspect to it, and, you know. Soften it up. Marzipan is a good call on that. You get this, mm. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, sweet ish, but not really sweet almond thing. Yeah. Mm. That's the beauty of doing these tastings from home. I don't have to drive anywhere. The only thing I do is drive you nuts, but that's all right. <laughs> Ooh, David's asking, is anyone familiar with Spearhead? Uh, just popped up recently. It's a single grain from Loch Lomond. Yeah, Loch Lomond, uh, obviously another distillery that is a powerhouse of making whatever the hell they want, you know, 13 different types of spirits. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, I don't think I've ever, ever seen a, um, a straight spirit from them. They're an interesting company, aren't they? They're so interesting. Bloody weird, I think. <laughs> It's like everyone who works there is like straight out of a you know mental assignment room. They're like, we're gonna make whiskey, but it's gonna be weird and cool. And you taste it, you're like, this is delicious, but I'm very confused. <laughs> um, yeah, so apparently they've got a the single grain out on the market called Spearhead. Um, I personally haven't tried it either, but yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. to check out. Um, interesting, all mid palate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Again, there's, there's that um, 
I'm presuming it's wheat. You, you, you get that sort of slightly hard edge to it. Yeah, interesting. But then again, you, and then, then you've got all this um, toffee and butter and, and, and other things sort of working its way around it too. Mm. And, and this is still available as well, interestingly enough. As I said, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that's the thing, you know, grains fly so far under the radar, you know, good to pick them up when you can. Kind of like a really old Armagnacs and Cognacs, you just fly under the radar, but, you know, you can get great stuff. Yeah. Basil, you're hitting the note. Absolutely. You're killing us tonight. <laughs> I know. Basil should be doing my job with the tasting notes. <laughs> oh. All right, shall we crack on? The next one is actually probably going to be one of the sweeter. Uh, it's a sherry cask one. I smoke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, your pellets come back to life. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're um, moving on to number five. Mm. Which is good. Um, North British. Um, and this is what uh, we were talking about before. They, they, this is the big one. So um, United Distillers and um, uh, interesting. Um, um, I was going to say, this is um, basically an, an independent distiller. This is really interesting because what happened is that the Edrington Group, which is, as we know, is McKellen and Pylon Park et al. And United Distillers, as it was then, and now we know as Diageo, basically cooperated in building a, just a massive grain plant. So I suppose spreading the costs of, of production. And as you rightly said, you know, it's sort of Tanqueray, Smyrna, off Johnny Walker, all the Johnny Walker grain comes out of here and famous grouse as well. So that, so we've mentioned that, you know, uh, United still has had a number of grain plants, but they just essentially what they've done is that they've condensed it down to a couple of big plants that are really, really big and, um, and if you can spread the cost, uh, more, the, more the merrier. Um, now, the beauty of this one is that we're going to be a little bit different tonight because this has actually been matured for 32 years in a sherry cask. And at that stage, you're all supposed to go, woo! <laughs> so this is, this is the outlier. Now, it's quite extraordinary that it has matured that age. So I'm expecting, again, that that cask has been probably very well used. Um, and we can even see on the colour of it, it's not a big dark black thing. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, quite light in colour. So, again, once again, it's a fairly neutral cask. Um, so as I said, we're in Edinburgh now. We're right, right in the heart of it. Um, I jointly owned a, a plant that's huge. Let's give that a try. The, this base is predominantly maize. So ah, right. related to corn, I still believe maize and corn are two slightly different genetic plants. Uh, a lot of people disagree with me though, but um, yeah. So this is maize um, that's being used in this one. So previous ones that we've been trying to know have been wheat based. So this might be a little sweeter in them with that sherry cask on top, obviously, you know. Yeah, like Andrea said, licorice, rum, raisin, butterscotch. Yeah, no, no, that, that's a, that's a good call actually, and really interesting too because normally we see uh, corn or maize based, particularly out of America, and they become very oily and very sweet, sickly, mm -hmm. sweet. yeah, uh, lolly waterish. But uh, I think we're on something a little bit different here. Let's give that mm -hmm. a bell. Yeah, and you can get yeah different flavor profile on the nose as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another cool fact I found came across while I was looking at uh, North British because it's it's one of my uh, my old boss's favorite grain distilleries. But it was founded um, after Diageo made a monopoly on grain plants in Scotland, and so a couple of small distilleries were like, "Well, let's build our own so that we don't have to pay hiked prices." And now uh, it's owned by Diageo. <laughs> yes, yes, they're That's everywhere. An irony. Yeah. That's got a cracker of a palette that just starts mm. right at the front and just coats the entire palette. Really crisp and grainy. It's it's a slightly oily, 
but not sickly sweet. Yeah. Mm. Really. Uh, somebody noticed up there some rum notes. I probably concur with that as well. Yeah. Mm. No rum was harmed in this production of this product. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. David's asking, there's been heaps of malt distilleries popping up in the past, past five years. Have there been any newish grain distilleries built? I think Not there was all. one recently. I think it'd be like a bit like Australian with the craft industry. Everybody, everybody sees the quality in uh, uh, malt distillation rather than grain. And you really, if you're going to go into grain distillation, you'd need to be. I, I think you'd really need to be big, which is um, which is the thing. Mm -hmm. And that that's that's the nature of it. Yeah. So I'll let you into a little secret. All the gin distillers out there, all 180 of them, whatever it is in Australia essentially all buy their spirit off Tarak. So they don't actually make the spirit themselves. And in fact, they're encouraged not to. Yeah. Mm. And even for like smaller distilleries in, in Scotland, I was, um, I found out North British is part of Ladnox Pure Scotland. Um, spoke to the oh. master distiller and he was like, yeah, we, we source it from North British and I believe Invergordon as well. Yeah. But um, yeah, so even like smaller distilleries who, are making blends to them it's not really worth the the financial investment in opening a grain distillery it is just easier to buy it yeah it, it, it's yeah let, let them have the, it's, it's cost all we're talking about is money and that's exactly what the scots are interested in that's true <laughs> keeping it as cheap as possible so cave needs actually have a gin uh called old raj and again, that spirit's been bought in. And I think I've got a suspicion that actually comes in from North British as well. Mm. Yeah. 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 So we like that. I'd have some uh, beauty. I'm loving these tasting notes, you know, toffee apple, oily, you know, molasses, yeah. sticky honey. Sticky honey is a good one. Mm. Coated popcorn. Oh, yes. So good. Again, that. Uh, Flavor descriptors, you know, there's a, there's a myriad of them, and we're coming, you know, in some regards, we're actually coming up with more flavor descriptors than we do with a normal, say, uh, whiskey, you know, a malt tasting. And again, mm. so that pushes that thing. These guys are really are quite complex. There's a lot going on in them. And again, mm -hmm. because we're not being dominated by oak. Yeah. Yeah. So, Howard's just added a little clarification. Maize is what it's called while it's growing, corn is when it's harvested. Um, that, that should be, yeah, right. I'm thinking of like um, blue corn and stuff like that as well. I'm like, is that still corn? But yes, maize and corn are pretty much the same thing, but different nomenclature. <laughs> so Thank you for that, Howard. Yeah, nice one. Yeah. Yeah. Because you see, uh, especially through France, you see, um, um, you see loads and loads of cornfields. You know, uh, and, and then it's basically for industrial, so either for ethanol or it's for um, uh, stock feed. So mm. it's, uh, uh, it's cheap enough for the um, the distillers to get hold of it. That's what they would do. So if that is, yeah, um, so we, we we do think it's corn. So um, that's a case where with fermentations, it's really difficult. So you need to use enzymes to actually get it going. Um, and, and to, to, to try and, you know, create that uh, alcoholic content out of them. Quite, yeah. diffi quite difficult, actually. So there's probably another reason why people don't want to play around with, uh, with you know, other grains. Barley is so much easy. Barley is easy, yeah. I've heard corn is um, very easy. To, you get a really high yield when you uh, ferment and distill corn. Okay. Um, uh, and, of course, in America... You know, and the main reason that they use corn was that it's so prolific. They paid farmers to grow corn to feed people. And then they ended up having so much. They were like, well, let's just make corn syrup, which is what they use to sweeten absolutely everything, even things that shouldn't be sweet. Um, so, yeah. So, and that's how that came about. But it's, yeah, good to see it in use for like grain spirits and stuff and yeah. really explore what it can be. And if you think about it, you actually eat, you know, eat a cob of corn 
and, and try it. It is extremely sweet. So there's a there's a lot of uh, um, sugars in there. Yeah, it's really really is quite jam jam packed with it. So you could probably get you know fairly you know fairly decent return on your on your on your pound spent. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm going to save that one. And so if that's the uh, penultimate. We now move to the ultimate, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we go from a 32 to a 34 year old. Um, but the ABV goes up 52.8. And we're going to Cameron Bridge. Uh, so we're basically a, across the lot, uh, across the uh, is it the Firth or Fourth, or whatever it is, the, the big river there of Edinburgh on the other side. We're at a place called Cacordi. And this is now Diageo, so the home of Johnny Walker's major distillery. And as I said before, these guys are pumping out 140 million litres annually, mm -hmm. non stop. Just, just amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, um, from when I was, uh, you know, doing some research, it's the largest grain distillery in Europe. It's not just Scotland, Europe. Oh, it's, so. it's in Europe, is it? Yeah. Yeah, in, in Europe, it's huge. Um, yeah, and like I was saying before, it's the base for Tanqueray, for Smirnoff, for Gordon's Gin as well. Um, just, just insane. Um, and then, of course, they're popping some into Johnny Walker blends and stuff as well. So they're, they're popping that up, yeah. So mm. just, just extraordinary. So let's give that a try. Yeah. Mm. Strong coconut and pineapple. Nice. Yeah, good call, Anthony. It's really biscuity on the nose as well. Yeah. Mm, like um kind of like uh when you get those like ginger and pineapple cookies kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good cool. Mm. Mm. It's also yeah. like rum note too on the nose as well. Yeah. Cherry ripe. Oh, nice one. You're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so this, this Cameron Bridge is actually founded by the Haig family, one of the sons of the Haig family. Mm. Um, and they eventually joined the Diageo monopoly <laughs> when it was a monopoly back in uh, the 1860s alongside Canvas and uh, Port Dundas. But yeah, it's absolutely huge. And Diageo has just put a lot, of, a lot of money, a lot of effort and a lot of backing into this distillery. And, you know, it's cool to actually see whiskey from this grain distillery rather than you know watch it sidle away into into other spirits so yeah super exciting yeah. i'm getting a quite a nice bit of uh, gingerbread and golden syrup on there as well mm. which, which is quite interesting like tropical fruit dessert notes is is what everyone yeah it's getting pina colada. Howard, stop it. Now I'm thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful thinking, isn't it? <laughs> oh, nothing better than a good pina colada. Colada. But 34 years of age, 52.8%. And again, this palate is just alive. This is not dead oak. This is not, you know, um, dead grain or anything this this has just got so much life and and, and zest going on and brilliant absolutely brilliant fantastic stuff all right well i think it's time we might see what everyone's favorite was so let's pop a little poll in the chat see what your picks were for the night so we love, you know, seeing, seeing what everyone's favorite was. I know I don't like to have favorites, but <laughs> that, uh, that North British was pretty cool for me. So it's a case of vote once, vote often? <laughs> it's democracy, sir. <laughs> <laughs> really? 
Yeah. Yeah. That was a little bit clever, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Number five, number six, people are thinking. All right, might call it. Sure, yes, I can. I'm still looking at how to do this thing. Looks like it's like the majority of you guys love the camera bridge, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah. fantastic stuff. Yeah, landslide. Um, yeah, so really cool. And just with that age as well, it's so fruity. Yep. Right. And I hate to say it, but that's sold out. So you've drank the last of it. You waved and dangled it in front of their faces. I know. Yeah. All very sad, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Any uh, any final questions? Yeah, sorry, Basil. Yeah, she's gone. Now, the, the, I was going to say that uh, Cadenets have gone through a bit of a, a restructure and um, it's probably a case that we, we used to remember the uh, small batch range and the single cask range at cast strength, but basically no more, you know, uh, uh, we're getting basically malts at the moment at 46%. So um, a few changes going on through there. So um, if you see these and, you know, your, your favourite stockers or something, I'd probably want to grab hold of them because uh, they won't, at this stage, won't be repeated. Mm. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, you don't often see, you know, you see a bit of independent bottlings of grain whiskies and, and basil. I'm, I'm not sure I haven't checked, but um, I'm sure that if you if you hunt, there may be some indie bottlings of uh, of Cameron Bridge. I know that um, Douglas Langs has done some occasionally. Um, they've done Strathclyde and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a it's a hunt, but it's a hunt well worth making. Um, <laughs> this heat number four, I believe, was. Do, 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 do. The canvas. Canvas. Oh, yes. Well, I'm getting to that. The next tasting. All right. I'm getting to that. Um, so, like I was saying and, and you know, uh, dropping hints earlier, um, this is our second last Top Shelf Tastings event. Um, and we have the tickets for the next one. So the next one is Benriac Peated mostly old. Uh, so most of the whiskies are over 22 years old from Ben Riak, uh, heavily peated, which is super, super cool. Um, and you guys will get first dibs on purchasing tickets for that. Again, there's only 30 packs, um, which is very exciting, very rare. Um, I believe Linus will be coming along for that tasting as well. Um, it'll be on the 25th of November. Um, and I'll just share the link to purchase tickets. It'll be live from 8.30. So from 8.30, you can uh, purchase tickets for the final of our top shelf tastings, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, Ben Reacts just such a, such a cool distillery and, you know, after it's revamp by uh, Billy Walker and, you know, now in the hands of, of the Jack Daniels group, Brown Foreman, it's, it's really a powerhouse with, uh, with their stuff. Oh, you should have access to the new. Yes. Um, but yeah, six single malt whiskeys, all heavily peated. Um, well. That's a trial, yeah. isn't it? Hmm? That'd be a trial, wouldn't it? Oh. All that smoke. <laughs> ben reacts great like that, though. It's, it's, yeah, it, it really it. captures that Isla smoke. Yeah, no, they, they do a good job. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. But yeah, so, um, but yeah, thank you so much, Graham, for, for joining us, for, you know. 
been an absolute mm. pleasure. Um, and as I said, uh, you are now part of that exclusive group of uh, aficionados of grain whiskey, and um, uh, you can certainly show off that to your to your malt friends as well. Tell them what they're missing. Yeah, and it's a great way as well to always use it as a great way to get uh, birthday year or birth year bottles. They are yeah. more accessible. Well, that- and- without hurting the hip pocket as well. Yeah, exactly. But uh, no, really cool stuff. Well, yeah, thank you everyone for you know, dra- dramming along with us. Um, yeah. It's been great sharing these really, really cool grain whiskies with you. Um, like I said before, the link for the recording will be out tomorrow if anyone wants to watch it back. Um, it was wonderful to see you. Hopefully we'll see you at the next top shelf tasting or the next tasting that we happen to have on um but yeah thank you so much everyone see you later okay thanks emma you've done a great job cheers